Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Caliber. Today, we're discussing genuine protection in times of market stress with the LF Ruffer Diversified Return Fund, an extension of the wider Ruffer investment strategy. I'm Chris Sarley, and today we're joined by Ian Rees and Duncan McInnes, manager of the elite rated LF Ruffer Diversified Return Fund. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, likewise. Good morning. Um, Ruffer as a firm has a sort of safety first approach to investing and, and you guys often use the analogy of being like a, a tractor on the motorway plodding through the slow lane, which is a very good analogy if I might add one in there. But um, could you maybe explain that philosophy a bit further for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with that one. So the, the Ruffer philosophy is, is one of what I call all weather investing. So what does that mean? It means trying to deliver consistent positive returns regardless of what's going on in the market or the economy. And I always think of this old quote from the economist uh, John Maynard Keynes, who uh, said it's about trying to be roughly right rather than absolutely wrong. And I think that's the way that we think about building portfolios. Now, the tractor on the motorway uh, metaphor is, is from Jonathan Ruffer, our founder. I think it's a little bit like the old tortoise and the hare fable uh, that, that we all know. And the idea is that um, sometimes investing with Ruffer can feel like being that tractor on a motorway and you're being overtaken by flashy sports cars uh, on occasion. But when the weather turns inclement and the road is icy and dangerous, you often find that the sports car ends up in the ditch and actually the tractor sort of plods along unperturbed. So really it's about consistent positive returns compounding over, over a long period of time. And that actually often or almost certainly ends up with a better outcome than higher, flashy, more volatile returns that are occasionally punctuated by large losses. Okay. And this is a sort of a new fund launch, the Ruffer Diversified Return Fund. And it's an extension, however, of the wider Ruffer strategy, which goes back the best part of three decades. Could you maybe talk us through that and why an absolute return fund was the, the best fit? Yeah, so... It is an extension of, of the Ruffer strategy that's been going going since the mid-90s. Um, so Jonathan Ruffer was the chief investment officer of Rathbones before he, he set up the firm. And he had a couple of insights back then that I think now appear quite obvious, but they were, they were quite novel uh, at the time. The first one is that the uh, investment industry is obsessed with benchmarking and relative returns. So uh, we are deliberately unbenchmarked and we try to keep the menu of what we can own as wide as possible. We, we go anywhere, we invest in, in almost anything, we invest across asset classes and, and uh, all geographies. And the second uh, insight that I think Jonathan had is what's now known as prospect theory, which is Daniel, Daniel Kahneman's idea that I think he won a, a Nobel Prize for. But the way, that, the way that Jonathan sort of phrased that was, clients like making money, but they hate losing it more. There is a real asymmetry to the way that we experience losses. You're much unhappier losing £100 than you are happy uh, gaining £100. So back in 1995, the, um, the, the, the phrase absolute return didn't really exist, um, but, it, but it has become much, much more popular, uh, especially post-financial crisis. And then it fell out of fashion again in the last, in the last few years because of some of the higher profile funds failing to deliver. But um, ultimately, we've always been doing uh, this idea of absolute return. Okay. And um, back when you launched the fund, you, you said that sort of traditional asset allocation models, and, and for those listening, that's the idea of having 60% in equities and 40% in, in bonds, will come under renewed stress as inflationary volatility rises and portfolio construction is ultimately challenging. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that for our listeners and, and, and how that works in practice and what we should be sort of wary of going forward from here? Sure. Oh, I think what's important, before we look forward, let's consider the world or the investment landscape that we're leaving behind. For the past three decades or so, we've been in a world of what economists would call disinflation. So you, you have positive inflation, but the annual rate of change has been falling. And this has allowed interest rates uh, to, to fall around the world. It's created a very fertile ground for asset prices. Just look at the performance of bonds and equities, amongst others, over the last 30 years. But what's more important, perhaps, is not just the performance. It's been that bonds and equities have been negatively correlated. And that negative correlation 
is what gives balance to that sort of 60-40 style equity bond portfolio. But we think a period of higher inflation and more, just a return of more uncertainty and economic volatility will provide a number of headaches for investors to consider. We think that, that higher inflation will end the three decade long bull market. And perhaps unsurprisingly, conventional fixed income will struggle when inflation is rising. But we also think equities will face much, uh, much stronger pressure than they have in the past. But the real key, again, from our perspective, is the role of diversification. Looking back through time, when inflation has been above 3%, 3.5%, the correlation between bonds and equities has actually been positive. So we're not talking about extreme levels of inflation. We're just talking what I would consider a bit above target. Really what we and other investors need to consider in this world is where are you going to find diversification if your bonds and equities are moving in tandem and as we fear, falling at the same time? Okay. Um I guess we'll sort of take a step on from that. So, so how does this fund sort of fit into this new type of environment? You, you mentioned the diversification there. Does that mean more asset classes? Maybe just give us a bit more insight in how that works in practice within the sort of under the bonnet of the fund. Sure. I mean, look, at a very simple level, the fund, you know, we're aiming to provide a low correlation to you know, wider financial markets and provide investors with genuine diversification. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. What are we doing? Well, our real concern when we talk about higher inflation is actually a period of financial repression. It's where inflation runs above the level of interest rates. So the real value of your capital is eroded. We think that would be a very, very difficult period for financial markets to, to, to absorb. And to protect against this, we have holdings in inflation linked bonds in the United Kingdom and via the United, United States and also gold through a mix of bullion and gold mining equities. I've spoken a lot already about the need for you know, new sources of negative correlation or an offset. And here we're making use of less conventional assets such as derivatives. And these can be very helpful from a portfolio construction perspective. We've used them in the past and continue to use them to reduce our interest rate risk, for example, and also we use them to protect against uh, equity market weakness. We, these have been um, an evolution, if you like, that you know, they are relative the new additions to our strategy over the last decade or so. And that's come out of a real need to find a, um, new protective assets. We think that traditional havens, if you like, such as conventional government bonds, no longer can provide investors with the protection. And we're needing to look for the less conventional or um, common assets to provide that for our portfolio. I appreciate it. Uh, I sort of went off a bit there. Um, also, you know, we, uh, it might have sounded already that we're you know, somewhat bearish or pessimistic. Whilst you know, that, that may be the overarching tone, we do think there are opportunities within equities. The portfolio today has about 35% exposure to the asset class. But we think there'll be particular winners. Um, we think those such as you know, commodity uh, companies, industrials, financials will probably fare better in a world where inflation is higher and we're seeing faster nominal uh, economic activity. And, and, and just one final point, Chris, if, if I may. We think it's as important to consider what you don't own in this world, in a world where interest rates are held below the rate of inflation, we think the epicenter of where not to be invested is the conventional bond market. So government bonds, although we've seen yields move slightly higher in the last few months, we think you know, very much deserve the title of return-free risk. Um, let, let's try and sort of bring everything together then. So obviously we always hear on all these podcasts about managers the, the importance of process and risk. And but, but you guys sort of, try to do something unique. You, you sort of look at the previous 100 years of data, I believe, and, and how does that work in practice? I mean, for example, things like wars or, I mean, the COVID sell-off in 2020, the fastest in history. How, how does the fund sort of work to counteract those sort of scenarios? Yeah, I think that that's an interesting question because lots of the fund management industry looks at historical data 
I don't think many do go as, as far back as we do. And one one good example of that actually is is to do with the, the bond equity correlation that, that Ian was talking about. Much of today's portfolio construction is based on an, an, an assumption that stocks and bonds are negatively correlated. And uh, that's because that's what the data says. But that's what the data says if you go back only to the 80s. If you go back to the 1880s, <laughs> if you include an additional century of data, actually most of the time, in the last 140 years, stocks and bonds have been positively correlated, and that's the environment that we've moved back into. We think in the last, in the last little while, but b- more broadly than that, your scenario analysis is is an important part of our investment process. It is important to state that it is it is just one input into uh, into discussions. You know, it informs our discussions and decisions, but it doesn't drive them. Uh, and I think what we what we do, how how would I describe what we do? We um, stress test today's portfolio by by running it through this analysis and seeing how it would have performed in every so how today's portfolio would have performed in every major market event in the last hundred years or so. So hypothetically, how would today's portfolio have performed in the 1929 crash or in on Black Monday in 1987, or in positive shocks like the, the NASDAQ melt up in the late 90s or the commodities boom in the early to mid uh, 2000s. And you can also do a sort of create your own disaster. So, so uh, what would happen if the Fed raised interest rates by 200 basis points overnight? And the oil well, price fell. global pandemic. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. Exa- exa- exactly, yeah. Um, and and what would the, the sort of consequences in that be? So you can you can stress test the portfolio in all these different ways, and then we use that as a jumping off point for discussions. So, for example, if today's portfolio would have a an, what we deem an unacceptably large drawdown, and and the max drawdown on the strategy over the last twenty seven years is less than ten percent. Um, so that's sort of what we're talking about. Um, if today's portfolio would have an unacceptably large loss in a scenario, so say uh, in, in a repeat of the Nikkei crash of 1989, you know, when Japan had its bust, um, then we can talk about it and say, well, what do we think the likelihood of a rerun of that event is? And in that instance, for example, it's pretty unlikely because even today, the Nikkei is still down about 40% from where it was in 1989. Yeah. Uh, and, and the valuations are, are completely different. Back then, it was the most expensive equity market the world had ever seen. Today, it's the cheapest major global equity market in the world. So it seems pretty unlikely it's going to have the same uh, same type of crash. But so we can we can discuss the likelihood of a repeat of that scenario. And then from there, we can discuss what we might want to do in the portfolio to protect or insulate or change um the portfolio so that so that we're no longer exposed to those risks. And and just quickly, Dan, because um you did mention it there. Um you do look at positive scenarios as well. And I, I want to sort yeah. of emphasize that this this, <laughs> this fund isn't isn't sort of just you know the, the eternal pessimist fund. It does look for opportunities when they do arise. And I just want That's, to thank you, thank you, thank you very much for mentioning that, Chris. Yeah. We're sort of yeah um I I said to someone in a meeting yesterday, you know, same old rougher, always boring, always bearish. And that, I think that that's that's the stereotype and it's totally it's totally unfair. Uh, we are known as as bears, as bear market operators, and that's because we've made money in the three big crises since the firm began, uh, you know, the dot-com uh, financial crisis and then the COVID crash. But but we've made money in uh, 26 of the other, <laughs> you know, 20, 26 of the 27 years that we've been we've been around. So yeah, most most years nothing bad happens. Markets are positive and hopefully rougher is positive too. And um, just lastly, obviously, you're supported by a big team of 30 analysts covering both macro and, and micro focused security selection. Um, obviously, that's a lot of sort of potential options and voices. How, how does the team make decisions on where to invest and to take advantage of opportunities? And um, maybe give us an example, if, if possible. So really, Chris, the, yeah, the key driver of returns at Ruffer is our asset allocation. Yeah, it was the setting of that that allowed us to deliver a positive return during the, you know, the dot-com bust, the financial crisis, and actually make money in, in March of 2020. That, that is the key uh, for Rafa. And this is set by a team of senior fund managers and members of the research team. And it's led by our chief investment officer, Henry Maxey, and our chairman and founder, uh, Jonathan Rafa. And building on what Duncan has said, really, 
what we're looking for here in this meeting. What are the key risks? What do we need to protect our clients and investors' capital against? You know, what are the assets for that? But, but also, what are the opportunities that we see? You know, where can we make money? More often than not, at least in my financial lifetime, your times have been good, and we need to participate in that. You know, we're not hiding, waiting away. There's always a balance between sort of growth and protection in our asset allocation. So keep it at a high level. Once that you know, portfolio structure is sort of set from the top, we then make use of our internal research team, just about 30 analysts, give or take, who are tasked with finding ideas to, to fill the portfolio. There's a mix between what you would call bottom-up and top-down decisions. So bottom-up, for, for anyone who, who's not familiar, is very much an idea which is not driven by a sort of macroeconomic or you know, a strategy view. For example, the bottom-up idea today would be something like American Express, where our analyst has high conviction on what we think you know, the, the recovery of the economy will be and the company's uh, earnings growth potential. So you will always have some of those ideas. But the top-down ideas are where the analysts are more closely connected to the asset allocation. So for example, today, we have a preference to own economically sensitive uh, equities. And you know, a specific example, if you like, Chris, of you know, how that's come to fruition would be where you know, we've, we've tasked the research team or the analysts to find what we think are the best expressions of playing the energy sector. So you know, we think that energy will be a beneficiary in this new world, you know, rising demand, but also constrained supply. And we want to participate in that. And the analysts you know, have a task to go away also considering your know, ESG factors, what we think are the best expressions uh, to play that. I think you know, a couple of key points, if you like, we have one strategy. So you know, the analysts, all of their focus is just on that one approach. There are no you know, conflicts in that regard. Uh, and also just you know, the analysts always need to be mindful of the house view. So mm -hmm. if you are an analyst pitching you know, a UK banking stock in 2007, that wouldn't have made it into the portfolio. Ian and Duncan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having us, Chris. The LF Ruffer Diversified Return Fund is an absolute return vehicle which has the protection of investor capital at the heart of its process. As the managers have explained, asset allocation is a key driver of returns in the portfolio with a strong emphasis on capital protection at the core of their philosophy. To learn more about the LF Ruffer Diversified Return Fund, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. Mm -hmm.